bringing the scale down to things that tackle our daily life and individual ways of relating to future and desires, it was a way of grounding the agency on how we all have a space to construct our own, own futures. So I'm Maite, I'm currently Architecture and Design Curator at the Art Institute of Chicago. My practice I'm usually described as critical special practices and basically crossover architecture, design, performance and different ways to critically understand the, the built environment. My name is Emmett Byrne and I'm the Design Director and Associate Curator of Design at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. I am a trained graphic designer and I run the design studio for the museum. And I personally have a special interest in uh, new forms of publishing. There's a lot of different types of features that we're mapping out in the show, but I got really excited about understanding how the idea of the future can be made very personal and, and very unique to an individual or unique to a community. Working on the exhibition to me was more about the present rather than the future and how through recontextualizing our presence, we could gain agency in the future. Spaces for Everyday Life, that is this tapestry by the Sahrawi Union of Women. The tapestry basically would be a representation of a map. As we've learned through history, maps has been a tool of representation to gain ownership over territory. The Sahrawi as nomadic uh, communities have and still are to today struggling with gaining ownership over their own land. That representation enables a different claim towards the future, but it's a work that it's stating what there is right now and how it was since a long time ago. For me, one of the like revelations was this idea of small futures versus big futures and personal futures versus collective futures, allowing ourselves to understand the future existing within the present and then the future being as near as tomorrow, I think opened up a lot of doors. The show is mapping out such a broad range of diverse futures. I think one of the strategies was to put different scales of futures or different types of futures side by side within the, within the thematics. The first piece that you see in the show in, at the Walker's presentation is a video called Merger by a filmmaker and interface designer named Keiichi Matsuda. And this is a piece in which a woman is working in sort of this immersive work environment that is constantly feeding her information about how to be more efficient at her job. And it turns out that the company she's working for is almost completely run by algorithms that are there to assist her in being efficient. And it turns out that all of the dialogue within the film is actually lifted from real life self-help books, books that give you guidance on how to get jobs and stuff like that. All of the language is very much embedded in the present. It really takes this idea of just how much how impacted people are by their jobs and by the broader sort of capitalist systems that they exist within and how much that impacts their ability to envision their own futures. I think a lot of the projects that represent cautionary tales, it's really immediately obvious that they are just extrapolating trends in the present and playing them out into the future and that these aren't just you know, dystopian tales meant to sort of scare you. They're literally just trends that have that have reached their natural conclusion. A uh, really fundamental work is uh, Vina 48 by Stephanie Dinkins. Dinkins brings an amazing critique and alternative to on how even the databases that we're using for artificial intelligence, they're carrying out the structures of power. In this case, she specifically highlights the racist structures of those that databases and how then artificial intelligence perpetuates that, right? And with her project, she produces a critique and also offers an alternative on where we could move forward in a different way. Another project that operates in the larger scale too is driverless vision, which actually brings the notion of how the cities of the future could look like assuming that a driverless car. It operates in a fictional narrative, not a pragmatic one and it really pushes to the limit, like the, the structure of a future city. And in this case, rather than concentrate the conversation in the driverless car, which as an invention is already out there, why we're not being yet in, able to implement the driverless car is because we don't know yet how a driverless city works. So it's basically mobilizing the question of the design question from the device, the technological invention that exists, into the larger system uh, of the city. I got really excited about 
the projects that sort of blur the line between speculation and then actual reality and then interface with reality outside of the gallery. So there's a number of projects like the ZXX typeface by a graphic designer named Sang Moon, and it was designed to thwart optical character recognition software systems. And it was a larger commentary about privacy online. It was created before the PRISM scandal, but that was the moment that it became very popular. So this was an issue that was already in the air, which is actually something I think we've seen with a variety of projects in the show. They were created several years ago, but become more and more re relevant as things happen in the news and become obviously prescient. And it was really important for us to pluralize the word design in the title of the show because we were interested in mapping out a wide spectrum of strategies. Within the show, there's, there's envisioning, there's critiquing, there's hacking, there's the idea of tweaking. And so one thing that just comes to mind is, is design is becoming such a fractured field. Even though all the designers are trained in problem solving, that's the exact skill set that allows them to then pose the problems that are, are being posed in the show. And so this idea of asking questions and then actually making those questions, I think is really important. So a lot of the designers through the process of actually crafting the objects are in essence refining the question that they're trying to ask. Works like LIA, the pregnancy test that become minimal, maybe in the size of the device, but show a radical design. And those are out there, like the product, the packaging, they, they exist. So they're from the present, but there are also work that are pointing to how the niche of design has been occupied for whom are we've been designing. But what this device makes is like, it allows first like an innovation in the pregnancy test that hasn't been redesigned for decades and decades since it was invented. Um, but also it offers like privacy, and there is a control of the privacy within that. Even like the packaging of the, of the object is quite discreet, precisely to preserve that privacy. So it seems like a small gesture, but it speaks more about where we localize the scientific advancements, right? And that's something that design can do because ultimately design knows and needs to know about resources, materials, but also about cultural backgrounds and how and even more social, um, ways of behaving and using objects. So that is as a present tense uh, future, but I think it also opens to the future because it opens the discipline of design of where we overlooked areas of design and overlooked uh, profiles. There's something to the idea of designers actually making their questions. The Make the Breast Pump Not Suck project represents designers who are potentially starting with the form of a design brief in this case to redesign the breast pump, but then expanding that out to make the problem much larger and deal with issues of public policy and broader taboos. And then there are projects like the Fenty makeup, the Fora system, which I think those are real projects that are out there making an impact through their branding and their messaging. I think the relevance of, of the show falls not only in the selection of the people and projects represented in there. But what reinforced the questions better was actually how to context, how one project could recontextualize the other. It's more about how to inscribe any of these designs within the larger uh, system, what actually makes something accessible and gain agency. And I think that is kind of a through line that we, we didn't start with, but it appeared at some moment which is basically like, who owns the future? Who are these futures for? And does everybody have the same access to these futures?